make sure Jesus is there. What a great answer. If you want to have a successful relationship family, make sure Jesus is there. Is Jesus in our lives? Is Jesus in our marriage? Is Jesus in our bedroom? Is Jesus in our living room? Is Jesus in our relationship? They followed him. And he healed them there. Second. And uh, number two. Turn away from hardness in your heart. Turn away from the hardness in your heart. The biggest problem we see in this verse is that is hard hearts. First we see hard hearts against our master in verse 3. The Pharisees came to him, testing him, eh? asking him a question. But he also talked about Deuteronomy 24, which says when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts in her hand, and sends her out of the house. There are many people, including here, who think that uh, there are many divorces today than in the past. No, 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 not, not that exactly. During that time, divorce, they are giving divorce like they are giving karanga. For different reasons. And the divorce was less than 10 lines. 10 lines. They reached a point they would divorce for any reason. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Because of the hardness of your heart. Go read that Deuteronomy. Find the reason I was talking about. So, I have always been under the assumption also that divorce was there in biblical times. But that's not true. It was generally easy for a man to divorce his wife in Moses' time. And the divorces from the earliest times were common among the Hebrews. Wives usually couldn't initiate the divorce, but a woman but a woman would pretty easily provoke her husband into taking the first step if she wanted to. So the divorce degree itself was about 10 lines long. I was shocked. And it requires two witnesses. And here was the process. The, had, the husband had to write her a bill of divorce drawn up by some legal authority. The decree had to be placed in the hands of the divorced wife and she had to go. It's simple as that. That was it. So controversy arose between the two schools of Pharisees. The Shaman school held that nothing less than untrusting and adultery could justify a man divorcing his wife. And then there was another school read by Hillary, and his disciples went to the other extreme. They contend that divorce should be granted for the freest of reasons, such as messing up supper <laughs> by overcooking it. So if you overcook your food or you didn't make a good ugari, they say that should be good to divorce your wife. Other valid reason for divorcing your wife included her going out on the street with her hair loose, spinning in the street, fleeting with men, or being noise, noisy woman. And when we talk about noisy woman, what noisy woman was that? For example, if you talk loud and the neighbors hear you, <laughs> that was another reason. If the neighbor complains that she's loud, the, wife, the husband will divorce you because of that. So you wonder these the people are being divorced because they put the toilet right here, the socks are all over the places. So even then, because the sin did not start here in America, brothers and it has been there for a long time. People have always found reason to get out. Reason to get out. So this is what Jesus is being asked. So, with all this because of time, they, they, it talks about different, very little minor things that they were using for divorce. And finally, Jesus says, you know, the reason this was happening is because of the hardness of your what? Your heart. There are many reasons why people divorce or they divorce in the past. But Jesus sums that it is because of the hardness of your heart. Some scholars have said, for example, chronic abuse, we know, sexual and the physical abuse is one of the reasons we have today. Chronic substance abuse, infidelity, 
trust being betrayed by deception, lies, emotional and physical abandonment. This is the reason that we find today. Verbal brainwashing, which impairs self-worth. These are the reasons some scholars have said are reasons for divorce. And the personal safety and the protection of children causes divorce. Other top reasons for divorce today include money problem. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Money problem, communication, poor communication, changes in priority, intimacy issues, and lack of commitment. We could list and list more reasons for divorce. But Jesus boiled all of them down into one reason. A hard heart. Moyo, namna gani? Mugum. Whenever a couple gets divorced, at least one of them is making decision with a hard heart. Is that correct? At least one of them. And they need to have their heart softened. And that can only happen by following Jesus who heals the heart. How can we overcome our family problem? Turn away from the hardness of your heart. There's a promise that God will give us a new heart. You remember that? How many people pray about that? Lord, give me the new heart. I'm hurting. There's a reason why you're hurting. Those reasons are justified. Who can lift that burden in my heart? Only God can. And God wants to heal us. And then we need to be able to go to him. He talked about happiness and joy. True happiness and joy comes from God. And it's something that we need to pray for because it's a gift that God has to give. And I know so many people, I'm saying this with a very heavy heart, that even as we speak, there's somebody going through some rough time. There's somebody is in the middle of what we're talking today. Not only do we need to pray for them, we need to give also the, pro- the privacy and the time to hear. We need to be supported in a way that does not make things worse than they are. We need to make sure that we don't stigmatize people's issues. Because if we don't have that problem, you have another problem, right? We all have issues to deal with. Number three, let God set the standard for your home. And so you remember it says, God says the man and the wife will come together. So what's the standard? The standard here, as we know, God intended our life to be a better life, to be happy. When Adam got uh, his wife, the scripture says that God took man and, from, uh, and, and formed from his, his side, in Genesis 2, 18, it says, she's called help meet for me. That is help that was fit for him. In other words, she was to be the other half of him. He was only half a man. Adam was only half a man. And she was to be the other part of him. One writer, Aaron, says, marriage was intended to bring a human happiness. In the book of Genesis, we read that when Adam saw Eve for the first time, he said, this now is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of my out of man. Someone called this the first love song. In the original language, Adam is expressing tremendous excitement, a joyous astonishment, astonishment at being married to this woman. His statement could read more like this: I have finally found the one who can complete me. Who takes away my loneliness? Who will be be dear to me as my own? Fresh. She is beautiful. She is perfectly suited to me. She is all I will ever need. This was God's original plan. And Jesus pointed to them this plan. But there was more. As the Lord often did, he raised the bar far beyond the Old Testament. He talks about how, you know, everything that happened most of the time was because of the hardness of their heart. So what I'm saying here, God has a standard. They are very difficult to reach sometimes. By God's help, God can help us reach there. 
Let's pray for that God standard. As I close, number four, don't be overwhelmed by obstacles. There are so many obstacles. So many obstacles. And these obstacles can be summed in that text when they say, if that's the case, it's better not to marry. You remember that? They said it's, not, it's better not to do what? To marry. Have we ever felt like that? What did I get to this first? I don't know if I told you. Before I met Esther, I had two years. I'm going to finish this. I had two years. Two. And my theological stand, Pastor, I'm not getting married. Two years. Two years. How did I come with that uh, <laughs> stand? Because I listened to the preacher and I read the books saying, you know, marriages are doomed. So many divorces. Some people say the 50% people who are married, they end up divorcing. I'm in the view that probably that is over exaggeration. I think there are many marriages that survive more than 50%. It depends on who you read. I really think that they are more than 50%, probably in the 70s. Because you know, people don't know about the good news. They only know the bad news, right? How many people are here been married for a long time here? There are many, right? So when one happens, then we think it's happening everywhere. There are many people who they may not have, uh, every day is not a happy day, but they have been together for a long time. So marriage work. So I read those statistics. I remember I was reading that book. I remember Nyambichu was a pastor. There was a book I was reading that. Who knows Pastor Nyambichu? I think he was from Kisi. Nyambichu. What's what? Nyambichu? Somebody? Nyambichu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we were at school together. We were reading those books. So the question was asked in that book, Building a Better Home, if this is the case, what is better, to marry or not to marry? The writer says, whatever you choose, you're going to regret it later. Whatever you choose, and then he explained, if you choose to marry, there's some work to do. If you think everything will be rosy, you're going to regret it because you had wrong assumption to begin with. But if you don't marry, and you are not uh, given the gift of being single, it's going to be difficult for you. You're going to have lonely moments. Most of us were not created to be alone. Let's face it. True or not? We are not. That's why we have this hate love relationship. You want it, you don't want it. Eh? And it was summed one day in a seminar when women were complaining about their husband, how they are fighting, whatever. One woman who was single for a long time, she said, hmm, you guys, you are complaining about uh, fasting with your husband. Some of us, we are even looking for someone to fight. We don't have one. Tunatafuta kugombana nae, lakini hata kugombana nae, ha? Hatuna. So marriage is like uh, two people who live in the house, and one doesn't want to go out, another one wants to stay. Want to go out, another one wants to stay. So you, will need, you tell the roommate, look, I don't want to go out, I don't want anybody to be bothered, so take the car, put it in the garage. When people come, they see there's nobody here. But go with the kids, I don't even want to. So one goes out, they take the keys, and it looks like there's nobody there. You go inside. This person here, they go out there, they don't come on time. Or they lose the key. And they are inside, you sleep, you do your thing, now you want to go out. But you can't go out because the door is what? Closed. And if it is in Kenya, I'm going to grill. You can't go out. But the key went with somebody who went out. And they are trying to come in, they can't get in. So relationships sometimes like that. There are people who want to get out, but they, they can't find a way to get out. At the same time, there are people who are out who desire to come in. Every place you are, it is okay as long as you are with Jesus. Amen? That's why we need to invite Jesus in our life. As someone at a foot, are you looking for somebody to fight? You know, sometimes fighting sometimes also is fun. Life will be boring. <laughs> Life will be boring if everybody said yes for everything you say. Sometimes relationship is fights by argument. The problem is that some people are not comfortable or they feel intimidated, they feel insecure when 
people are disagreeing with them. So all we need to do is to be comfortable to live with the ambiguity, to live with the disagreement, and be fine. That you can go to sleep even if we didn't finish all the conversation with your wife. And they say, you know what? We can start tomorrow, my dear. Let's just go to sleep. Let's go to sleep. So I didn't want to marry because I was scared. Why? There was another statement that says, if you get married, you lose your 50% of going to heaven. You lose 50% of going to heaven. And I was dedicated, I want to go to heaven. Why should I lose my 50% by getting married? I'm not getting married. And they said, why losing 50%? It's because you bring another sinner in your life. You already have enough for sins. And then you bring another sinner in your life. Now you have two sinners living in the same room, sleeping in the same bed. Heaven becomes difficult. You see what I'm saying? Two sinners. It's already a problem to have one sinner. So I said, if this is the case, let me be by myself. Then I heard another preacher say, if you are not married and have children, you can never understand God fully. I said, what? So if, you are, if you, you, you are not married, you don't have children, you cannot understand God fully. What does that mean? He says because marriage in the family was intended to be God's objective lesson. So until when you have children, you raise them, you want them to go this way, and they choose to go this way. You see, you, see, eh? you tell them this is what is right, they tell you why. Tell me why you think this is right. They question you. They test your temper. They test your knowledge. And you end up chasing them, go to sleep because you have no answers. And then you go to bed and say, what's wrong with these kids? How can you continue to support and love the kids who don't listen to you? You are talking about kids. Wednesday evening, in the evening Sabbath, people have prayer requests for their children because they are struggling at home. Because they want children to be everything they want them to be. You understand what I'm saying? That's exactly what, what do, we, do, we do to God. It says you cannot understand God until you also start reaping the same here on earth that God our Father have given us a textbook when he wants to live this way, but we live differently from what God tells us to do. And yet God loves us. So when you get married and have children, your children, they are there to teach you about the, the, the love of God, the mess of God, the wrong suffering, the faith of God. God loves you regardless. And then you need to have these children regardless. Uh, you, you don't have You need to have these children what? Regardless. Even when they deliver bad news that I'm no longer interested in church. I don't know how to come to church. You still need to love them. Even if you hear some gossip about your lifestyle of your child, you still need to love them. So if you are not having children, you can never understand God fully, how he have dealt with us. But also, it has until you live with a wife or a husband, when you married him or you married her, she was an angel. You would go that to her place early in the morning. Whatever she said, you jumped. Huh. <laughs> I'm a tutesa. <laughs> you go to the place, they have a dog. Do you like a dog? Say, yeah, I love the dog. In your heart, I say, I, I hope she doesn't bring the dog. But because you want her, everything, you love the dog and the cats and everything. <laughs> you love everything. You love the parents, right? Because you have an agenda, right? Now that you have her or you have him, your true color have come out. You cannot understand God until you start living with somebody who thinks different from you. And yet the Bible says, love one another. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Let your interest not be above the interest of the other. You need to live with that person. You cannot understand. So I said, now, Caleb, what do you do? All right. So I decided I'm going to get married. Thank God. I got to Esther. You know, God sometimes gives you something 
You don't know what he gave me. I'm here, I'm surviving because of her. Now it's 32 years. Thank God. She's still alive and I'm still alive. <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's a miracle. That's a what? You are still alive. And so, the point I'm saying here, brothers and sisters, God knows everything. But he has promised, I'll be with you till the what? Just follow me. I'll be with you. Allow me to calm your heart and soften your heart. Do not let the cares of life take you away. Stay on the mission. At the end of the story, we all want to be saved. You and I, and our spouses, and our children, and our family want to be saved. Thank you, choir, for that song. This is not our, our home. We want to be, to go there. But how can we go alone? So he said, we need to go and bring others to Jesus so they can go with us. But how can we go with others but we don't go with our spouses and our family members? So our first mission field is our families. Let's be kind to one another. Let's be patient with one another. God is not through with you. Even if things are difficult, treat that family member as a stranger. If you treat them as strangers, you actually can be nice because we are nice to strangers. Don't we sometimes nice to strangers? We say hello to you with a smile, right? I woke up in the morning and I say hello, hello, Pastor Many, with a smile. Hello, Pastor Migombo, with a smile. That smile self, the mistake, say, oh, he still loves me. He still loves me. Okay. And then he says, oh, hello. We do that to strangers. Let's be nice to them just like we treat our co workers at work. Sometimes they do stupid stuff. They get on our nerves. But we still, we choose our ways. Right? That we say to them. Because we know if we don't choose our words carefully, there is a consequence that work. Let's treat our spouses and our families even as much. You know how we speak to our bosses. Sometimes they want to quit, but we still need that money. So you pretend you love your job, Right? And they still do stuff. And then we choose our words. What if we even, at the minimum, we did that at home? People will start feeling different. God wants to save you as much as he wants to save somebody in the family. We are all traveling together. We're going to be this together. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. Even when things don't work, let's not be enemies. Let's take care of ourselves. Let's be honest with our children. For those of us who are older, like us, let's be careful with our children. You have a daughter, you have a son. You have had your marriage. You have, give them space. Give what? Them what? Space. Space. Hey, those older folks, say, eh? Hey, those of us who have grandchildren, give your children some space. If they are making mistakes, it's okay. Allow them to make mistakes. God's grace is still available. God will take care of them just like he has taken care of you. You did not come this far because you're good. Give them space. Go and pray for them and then God will be with them. How many people say, God, help me? I want to go do something. Do you want to stand with me as we pray today? Let's stand up and pray. And I've taken a long time for you. Some of you will come back. Some time won't come back. If you don't like what I say today, I'm leaving tomorrow. So pray for my rich there, say for it. But I'm praying for you that God will be with you. Because I want you and me and all of us to make to heaven. Whatever situation you are in, God cares about you. God cares about you. And don't let anyone think that God has abandoned you because of whatever is happening. God still cares. It's his promise. I'll be with you till the end. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we stand here. None of us is perfect. Try to share from the heart and from what you want us to do. 
I pray for the KCC family. Young, those who are single, sometimes some raising alone, those whose marriage and family is going through some rough times, those who are still married but still have issues, we are still clinging there, but we have challenges. Our young people who are trying to find themselves, sometimes they don't understand as parents. They would rather talk to somebody else, not talking to us. We're all going through something. I just ask, Lord, that you find a way to get into our hearts. Win us over to you. Let's be open to you if we can't be open to anyone. Help us to give you our hearts so that you can heal us. Help us to know what you want us to do. Give us the power to do it. Your promise may be fulfilled that will be with us till the end. That if we have sinned, we can come to you and expect forgiveness. That if we are heavy laden, you're going to help us and lift the burdens from our shoulders. Let that be true for everyone who's standing here today and those who listen to, to, uh, to this online. Lift our body and help us to see light at the end. May your grace be sufficient for every one of us. May you keep us from falling. May you keep us from temptation. May you protect our faith in the middle of everything. And to keep our hope knowing that at the end, all shall be well. The children are still growing and may not understand everything. Keep them safe. Protect them from the influence of the evil one. Even when we fail, may your grace cover our mistakes. So that your kids can still find a way to love you and trust you when they grow up. We thank you and we give our life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.